What you're about to experience is a free, worldwide, interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. Hey, welcome to episode number 163. Well, <laughs> that made me look. This is Category 5 Technology TV, uh, and it is uh, Tuesday, November 2nd, 2010. You've got, the date. You've got the date right this week. I've got the date right. Whoa. Nicely that. handled. At least we know you don't have it wrong. At least we know Nicely that I don't handled. have it wrong. Yes, indeed. Fantastic. So, Lieutenant Commander's not here this week. No. No. But Lieutenant Commander Ferguson had a good old time on Sunday I, night. I think, oh, did he? I tweeted that that is the most fantastic thing, because that's the one day of the year I can dress up like a Trekkie and not get beat up. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I received many compliments. Thank you very much. Wow. Wow. I uh, wore my hockey gear and I did get beat up, but <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> that was a different story. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the chat room, Category5.tv. We are not late, but if we are delayed, that might be internet buffering. Well, there you go. Welcome to that. That's just in case I start cussing, you can uh, blank it out. Like that, that seven device second we delay? Yeah. The seven second delay? Or I'll we just try, I, I will try to avoid feed? cussing. That would be good. Okay. Be I'll good. do my best. Hi, everyone. Welcome <laughs> to the, the chat room. Our live uh, website is category5.tv. We'd love to have you join us in the chat room. Get your questions in there. Uh, or, of course, if you don't have access to IRC or if you, for some reason, can't get into that uh, or don't want to, because it's madness, all the wonderful people chatting away. Uh, you can also uh, just drop us an email live oh. at category5.tv. What do you got? You know, it's been a mad dash tonight, eh? Yes, it has. So far, it's like, okay, everybody's here. John had uh, had some trouble with the uh, parking arrangements tonight, so there's a first time for everything. But John, are you John? John is here now. Running under the wire. Just got here. Just got here. Yeah. So we're rushing around, but yeah, uh, fantastic uh, news this week. John and Christy, our alumni, have. Uh, Officially been wed. Wow. So, Saturday. Saturday night. Last week Saturday. Wow. Congratulations. Nice. Congratulations. Robbie was there. Yeah, Thank I was you. there. Must have lost my invite in the mail. Oh, it was <laughs> a very small, <laughs> very <else>. exclusive <laughs> gathering. <laughs> <laughs> they could only invite their absolute favorites, Eric. Okay, well. Sorry, that's... All my brothers and sisters said the same thing you just did. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, congratulations from all of us, and I know... Uh, Thank you, guys. Yeah. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed the gift I got you. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of people uh, have tweeted just to say congratulations, and they're thinking oh, yeah. of you guys, so... Yeah. Excellent. Fantastic. Fantastic. Let's just... Uh, I'm going to give... It looks like uh, some people are having some issues getting connected to the, uh, to the feed, so I'm just going to give them a couple of moments to try to get reconnected, and uh, we'll see how that goes. All right. How about you? Well, I'm here. I'm connected. You're here? Okay, I'm, we're I'm... here. We're here. Looks like uh, there may be some connection issues tonight, but uh, certainly uh, we'll do our best to get those everything back up and running. Here we go. Things are coming back around. Are they coming around? Yeah. I okay. see Justin.tv's coming back. Hey, everybody. Sometimes these things do happen. And I'm thankful when they happen five minutes into the show instead of way, way into the show. Way in. So I'll just, uh, everybody's uh, kind of reconnecting here. Everything's working out. Good to have you here. Glad to be here. Glad to be alive. I am, in fact. Welcome, everybody. All right, let's see if we can get that, uh, that <laughs> the WMV feed back up and running as well. There we are. Welcome to the show, everyone. Sorry if you missed a little bit there. We were just congratulating John and Christy, who uh, got married on Saturday night. Christy, of course, is, uh, is a, a former... Uh, co-host on the show and then uh, worked in the newsroom and uh, loves talking about the weather. I was going to say and so much more than just a weather girl though. <laughs> I had to throw that in because then then anyone who's who's fairly new here will be like, oh yeah, I remember Christy. Yeah. The weather person. Mm -hmm. The weather person. So we're just congratulating John and Christy. Fantastic. Thank you guys. Tonight we are going to be looking at basic photo manipulation number seven. Uh, John is giving me signals. What's up? 
Are we frozen up? It's not. It might reconnect. We'll see if that uh, if that comes back. Um, tonight we're looking at uh, the seventh installment of basic photo manipulation using free software. Tonight we're going to be looking at a very simple way that we can. <laughs> You're having a lot of fun. Uh, a very <laughs> simple way that we can enhance absolutely any photo using the GNU image manipulation okay. program. This is my favorite error I've ever seen. Twitter is fantastic. The server understood the request but is refusing to fulfill it. That's just harsh. Twitter.com. We don't like you is what is. Well, <laughs> pretty much it's, the it's the alternative to the whale, uh, but um, Twitter. Yeah, I know what you want. I'm just not doing it. Yeah, pretty that's much. That's pretty much all that's, I'm saying. That's my response sometimes. <laughs> oh, the, number of, time, the that. number of times I heard 403 that. forbidden. The server understood the request, but is refusing to fulfill it. Yeah. And I'm going to have a little hello, my name is the server. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Twitter sometimes has little issues like that, yes. but Twitter's the kind of service, it's just like there's so many people connected all at once, so if you get an error, most likely if you refresh, you're going to be back up and running. But I so like you, that error. It's a cool error. It's because like when your computer has trouble booting up and it says, uh, no keyboard detected, press F1 to continue. Brilliant. Yeah, I like that. Brilliant. <clears throat> Fantastic. Uh, TSG joining us from Germany. Nice to see you. Love to uh, hear from anyone who's joining us in the chat room, uh, especially if you're new here. Love to say hello. Uh, okay, in addition to our feature on uh, basic photo manipulation, we are going to be qualifying you to win a brand new Brother MFCJ615W multifunction center printer. Sweet. So stick around for that. And what do you got coming up in the news? I know you're, you're clicking around. You, oh, you, you know your way. Okay, you well, know what you're doing. Google. Google, in fact, sues the United States of America. What? <laughs> yeah. Wicked. Because it wants to use Microsoft software. The government wants to use Microsoft software? Well, so I, Google is suing them. Yeah, that's a bit. Wow. Uh, I wish them I'm well. With Google. Yeah. Yeah, all right. We'll hear about that. Is this the beginning of the end for openoffice.org? I'm just posing the question. We'll get back to that. So stick around. Russia has had enough of Microsoft. It will make its own Linux-based operating system. Mm. Wow. And a 15-year-old boy is being charged with hacking their school board's website in a Mickey Mouse attack. Like That's literally? Right, boys and girls. Literally? Like, oh. I, don't, I don't know. Look out, Pluto. <laughs> <laughs> Stick around. We'll be telling you more about these and other stories in the Category 5 TV newsroom. We will. Really? You make that chair look like a rocking chair, dude. Well, you know, someday I'm going to get a John's chair. John's laughing. And John's like, yeah. John you said likes it, when you I said move it. around. He likes sure he does. trying to focus sure on. Sure he does. Yeah. <laughs> Near? Far. Okay. Near? Okay. 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 Far. Just poking fun. You have a good week? That was the look. Oh. That's like a grandfatherly, like, don't yeah. touch my slippers kind of look. I left those. I was going to wear my Crocs. <laughs> no, Dave. Nice. Speaking of grandfather. Oh, you are such an strong. adult. Indeed. Yes. So that's that's exciting. Okay, we got lots of questions that have come in. You've been tweeting like crazy. Okay. Sorry, kids. I have not been tweeting like crazy. Mm-hmm. You really need to, dude. I'm not sure. I have an excuse. Well, I didn't do it. Is that an excuse? You should tweet. Sorry that I haven't tweeted. I, you don't need to do it now. I can do that right this second. You, you really can watch. You see, and that will just prove that you really, it doesn't take a long time to tweet. You know, I can get this kind of abuse on, on any internet just, TV just show, saying, not dude. just Category 5. No, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Okay. Anybody uh, in the chat room, follow Eric and expect to have some tweets coming through? <laughs> they're, Corey they're does. All, yeah, they're just all anxiously Hi, Corey. your tweets. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So what do you got for me? Well, let's see. We have uh, some questions and some comments. Excellent. This isn't really a question. And this is from Robert Streets. Hey, buddy. I don't really have a question. I just wanted to say hi to everyone, and I didn't know where to put this. Oh, <clears throat> okay. I have been away for a while. I had to have open heart surgery. And, oh. Wow, you had a heart valve replaced. Um... I sure have missed all you guys, and it will be great to be back in the chat room and watch the show. See you soon. 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 <laughs> Robert <laughs> the Streets. The tongue twister, yeah. 
Robert, oh, okay. dude, it, I'm so glad that, uh, I mean, I, I expect from your email that, uh, that everything has gone well. But uh, yeah, I was wondering where you were at, this is RD Streets, and good to have you back. And uh, certainly look forward to chatting with you in the chat room and, uh, and seeing you here at Category 5. Thanks for the email. That's excellent. Yes. And uh, yeah, I hope, uh, hope that everything went really, really well with the surgery. Uh, a buddy of mine just had surgery. You know, there's days when he, he, he's feeling a little less, but he's doing just fabulously. Good. He's 100% he's, uh, better than he was. Very, 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 things went well. Speaking of surgery, is not at all related to open heart surgery or anything that critical. Guess who lost another tooth today? Um, my I daughter, say Tally. My daughter has a thing for banging her mouth off stuff, and she lost her first tooth. People see her and they're like, oh, that's so cute. You've already lost your first tooth. Yeah, that was the coffee table in the living room. <laughs> and that's what happens when children jump on the couch when they're told not to jump on the couch, and then they fall. My daughter has a little scar here. My daughter from, has a poor little scar on her forehead. Yeah, that's from jumping on the couch and hitting the oh, coffee yeah. table. No, or is that my son? My daughter's, they all have scars. <laughs> I didn't do any of them. I'm not responsible for any of them. <laughs> so to, today, well, it was yesterday that it happened, but today it was really, really loose. Guess what she did? Mama thought it would be nice to buy her new markers. Of course, it's a wonderful thing. Children love, five-year-olds love their markers. She couldn't get the lid off, and she decided that no matter how hard she had to pull, she was going to do so with her teeth. Wow. So, so hard. Can you imagine pulling a marker lid so hard that you actually break your tooth? I cannot imagine that. Like, you, there's a point of, like, resistance where you say, you know, okay, I'm going to stop here. I, I, I wouldn't even open a beer with my teeth, you know? I Definitely just, not. No. <laughs> I've seen people do it. But. So my poor daughter is two teeth down, <laughs> and she's five years old, so she's got a ways to go oh before my. those two teeth come. But fortunately, they're both front teeth, so they'll probably get be the first Get some photographs. Teeth. Definitely. Get I always get photographs. photographs. Always get lots of photographs. Yes. So that's my story about surgery for today. <laughs> wow. I didn't lose a tooth, MMD Murphy. Not this time. <laughs> okay. You coming out to hockey with me tonight? Not tonight. You could put on a microphone and you could <laughs> listen to the... <laughs> That'd be fun. ...the cheerful banter while I'm out in the ice. <laughs> <laughs> beep, 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 beep. Yes. Okay, Doug Townsend hey, has, Doug. has a problem. <laughs> Hi, Robbie and Eric. I am having a problem with Ubuntu 10.10. .10. I installed it on a computer with a 900 megahertz processor, 128 megabytes of RAM, and a 30 gigabyte hard drive. When I try to boot, it brings up the sign-in box, and I enter my password. Then it acts like it will boot correctly, but it goes back to the sign-in box. I have tried reinstalling with no change. I have tried different passwords, thinking perhaps the first one was too complicated and it wasn't, and I wasn't entering it properly. Still no change. The first time I installed this after entering my password, it would go to the desktop background with no buttons for applications, places, or system. Also, there were no buttons or date in the upper right corner. All I had was the standard Ubuntu 10.10 .10 wallpaper. Mm -hmm. I love the show. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Doug Townsend, Lanceman. Hey, Doug. <clears throat> okay, so I, I guess you got through the installation procedure, so the live CD worked for you then, right? So when you booted the live CD, were you able to see the desktop and everything seemed to function correctly? I know that the specs are really, really low. Eric's just drawn my attention to your RAM and uh, yeah. 900 megahertz processor, 128 megs of RAM, 30 gigabyte hard drive. So the specs on the system obviously are, are really low. It's an old computer. But with Linux, typically that's okay, but once you've installed Linux, it's going to try to enable some of those really cool new features like Compass, Compass Fusion these days. So that's like your cool effects that you get on your desktop and stuff. So those kind of effects could be trying to initialize and failing and then starting you back at, uh, at the prompt. So that's why I wonder if it does get to the desktop okay with the boot CD, which I think it, it must if you're getting through the installation. You didn't mention about using alternate install or anything like that. So um, if that's the case, what you could try is using uh, Ubuntu desktop safe mode to, uh, to disable any of those visual enhancements. So <clears throat> when you click on your name, instead of entering your password, what you can actually do there is you can, uh, when you first click on your name, it's going to bring up a little menu at the bottom of the screen. There's a few different accessibility options. 
and one of the options is going to allow you to change uh, your session type. So you can use, like, I don't know if failsafe is in there, but definitely like a recovery console is there uh, if you want to get into the terminal and fix stuff. Uh, but in your case, probably uh, Ubuntu desktop safe mode will get you through those visual problems that are causing it to go back to the beginning. You can go into um, system preferences, I believe, and appearance at that point, and make sure all of your uh, visual effects are set to none. So I believe by default, Ubuntu is going to try to set it to normal, which provides an improved usability and good balance, etc. If you set that to none, make sure it's set to none, and that's going to disable the, the main effects and stuff. The other option would be, of course, once you get into that with safe mode, is to hit Alt F2 to bring up your run dialog. So I'll just show you here. Alt F2 brings up the run dialog. And then just type metacity dash dash replace, and that's going to disable uh, Compiz from running on your, on your desktop at that time. So you'll be able to then judge if, um, if that's improving your user experience and getting it to the point where you're able to log in. Give that a try. See if you can get through that main issue of, of being able to log in. And if that's the case, if safe mode gets you in, then we could probably just disable some stuff in startup and, and you'll be good to go. Mm -hmm. So let us know, okay? Because this will probably be a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of things that you might need to, to do, but that'll be step one, getting yourself to be able to boot into the system, get yourself logged in. Uh, and then, of course, no doubt the chat room is going crazy with alternative versions of Linux. Arc Linux, DSL. Um, and the size I'm of sure your swap, Poppy uh, Linux has most likely been uh, been mentioned as well. Yeah, Agamotto mentioned Puppy, Puppy Linux, possibly others. So those are alternatives to Ubuntu. But to get your current Ubuntu going, give that a try. Uh, good guy mentioning Slacks, which might be a little more difficult to get set up because it's a little more uh, involved of an install process, I think. <coughs> DOS. <laughs> um, Agamotto's mentioning maybe the uh, swap partition shouldn't be more than three times size here. Yeah, do you think that that could cause I a problem? I just wonder. It's tough though when you only have 128 megs of RAM, isn't it? Yeah. Is but we only have a 30 gig drive too, though. True, true. So that's that could be a variable, but uh, but I would start with check your sessions. Check, you know, try try doing what I suggested and see if that works. But do let us know, because because I think there you know there could be other things that we need to look at. All right. I'm not getting any response in the chat room from from Doug on that. So hopefully uh, they'll catch this after the fact and let us know. Live at category 5tv gets us your email. All right. Well, Charles has a a little comment here. Are we? I just see. Oh, oh sorry. You I see just see coming in. Uh, guest 6731 is RD Streets. That's our buddy Robert. All right. Hey, buddy. It's good to see you. Nice to have you back. Uh, yeah, we were mentioning you a little bit earlier. Yes, indeed. Nice to have you here. You're late, and we've been worried sick. We have been. Yes. It's been months. Months. <laughs> <laughs> Great to have you back. OK. OK, Chaz Linux, or Charles. Hi, Robbie. Hey, Charles. Just watching an old show where one of your viewers asked about converting Dot .ogv recorded with GTK record my desktop. Mm, uh, video screen capture. Oh. Oh. That's what that application is. Oh, is that what that is? Yeah, I'm just telling you. Okay, okay, well, there you go. Anyway, and found so that you seemed surprised, I, so it's a good thing I yeah, mentioned it. Yeah, thank so you. Maybe there's somebody else that I learned didn't something. Know what that was. Well, anyway. Uh, anyway, he found that uh, Pity TV does, a, does the job nicely and ah. graphically. PTV. PTV. Did I get the syllabic stress in the wrong spot? I think it's uh, well, it's it's P I T I V I. It's on the uh, if you've, you've got a current edition of Ubuntu, you'll see it in sound and video. Well, PTV. According to the rules of the English language, the third last syllable should get the stress. So PTV, I guess you're right. PTV. P yeah, PTV. TV. P I T I V I. Video editor included with Ubuntu Linux. Uh, so cool. That that's good. Oh. Okay, so it's spelled. Oh, Charles. Blame it on Charles. Charles, you added a V. Charles, what were you doing, man? Way to go, Just Charles. Testing his knowledge, Just, eh? Yes. 
I got caught. You got caught. I got caught. You had no idea what you were saying. So there's going to be some controversy over this. The only w people, the only way that Eric can sound like he knows what he's talking about is if you spell things correctly. Because <laughs> he would have known where the syllabic stress, yes, to quote him, would have been, even having not seen the word. <laughs> Uh, let me do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Are we having fun yet? I hope so. Okay, so that... Uh, Suddenly got... Oh, well, some, somebody found something for you. Okay. Uh, what is so, it? So, this is from Peter Lewis. And hey, Peter. He did know... He didn't know Robbie's email address, so... I'm going to send this to him. Okay. Live at Category5.tv. Hello, Gadwell. Okay. Um, Dear Robbie, I know you like Star Trek, and I found this in one of my electronic catalogs. I thought of you as Trekker fan. You would like old-type Star Trek communicator. Ooh. Ooh. Now, I'm going to click on this link and just see what happens. I here. just tried to type it, but it didn't go, so oh. I must have typed it wrong. And you're not going to be able to see my... my uh, you can order this online from uh, Farnell. It's 51 pounds. Well. Okay. Now, now are those... Let's find out. With, as soon as he says Star Trek, I'm game. Let's see if I can find you. Okay. Oh, here we go. Oh, look at that. Ooh. We're teasing everybody. Because this is... Okay, I'm trying to bring up the email here okay. on my system so that I can put it up on your screen. Okay, what are we being sent here? Who's, who's, uh, that was Peter, right? That was from Peter. Thanks, Peter. Peter Lewis. Yeah. Wow. Look at that. Fantastic. A USB communicator <laughs> from the original series. Brilliant. And if that's not enough, it's ROHS compliant. Wow. <laughs> So what does it do? I, I would imagine that this is like a... Uh, Communicates. I would think maybe you could use this as a microphone for Skype or something like that, which only you would know that you're that cool because you're the one holding it. But maybe if you had video, then that's fantastic. I'm not seeing a whole lot of specs here. Product information, further information. But it only the weighs 0.22 kilograms. The picture kilograms. tells a thousand words, it right? It does. Fabulous. Thanks for that. Now, if you really want to get on my good side, you could send me one. Yeah. Instead of just a link, you know. Well, 50, the little blurb here says that Star Trek fans can rejoice. That's literally on there. <laughs> That's the first point in the bullet list. It's an officially approved replica of the original series communicator. I'll say. Far more than just a novelty. Shall I carry on? Absolutely. It actually can be used as a VoIP phone. Okay, I was right. Built-in microphone and speaker also allows it to be used for two-way voice communication. Used with most popular instant online internet messaging systems such as go. Skype, there MSN Messenger, AIM, and iChat. What more could you need? Or people? iChat. Now this is this is this brings up something because this one I see a, a cord coming out of the bottom, and and the the chat room is rejoicing at this point. But <laughs> have you ever thought now? Wouldn't it? be brilliant if they could put a Bluetooth device into one of these. I think that a lot of Trekkies would go out and buy that. I think you should hide that and we'll market it. Oh, shh. Somebody, anybody manufacturing in the viewing audience? Could you imagine as a Bluetooth device, you know, pick up your Bluetooth, pick up your phone, just tap it, the insignia, even if it has an earpiece, I don't care. Or just a little speaker phone. I'm going to the Dragon's Den with this. Bluetooth speaker I'm gonna, phone. I'm going to get some backing for this idea. I think that would be fantastic. I would buy one. But I would hope that I wouldn't have to because someone would love me enough to just send me one. Yes. Because it was my idea anyways, people. <laughs> I think every Trekkie has had that idea. Oh, there is but a downside to this thing. It's downside? compatible no. with Windows XP, Vista, and Mac. That's what they say. It doesn't mention Wine or Linux. Well, okay, but everything. Yeah, okay, never mind. A lot of printers, a lot of scanners, a lot of devices say... Windows and Mac. You plug it into Linux, it works. You don't need the disk. You don't need to go through any of the hoopla. So, almost guarantee you that it's going to work in Linux. <coughs> well, there you go. Okay. Gadget Wisdom Guru has a guy a who guy? says he can have anything made in China for him. Right. 
Fantastic. I will take a box of 1,000 Bluetooth Star Trek communicators. We're breaching some kind of copyright, <laughs> trademarks, and patent laws, and this and that, but boy, oh boy. Oh. Paramount's got to get on top of this stuff. All right, we should move on. <laughs> it's almost time for the news. But we do have fun, don't we? <laughs> Some uh, good guy wants a Veronica Belmont clone. Okay, um, we should move on here. Is it news time? Not yet. Not yet. We're getting if there. If you've got a question, this is Category 5 Technology TV. You'll find us online at www.category5.tv. Just had to interrupt before you get carried away. Me carried away? Come <laughs> on. You can get your questions in in the chat room or email us live at category5.tv. We're here to answer your questions with regards to tech. And certainly we love Linux, and we'd love to have some questions about Linux as well. We're just rocking these questions. Okay. I think we saw that one before. Okay. Have you got any short ones? Because we've got about four yeah, minutes. Yeah, I'm news. thinking. No, I'm not going with that one. No? No. Why? What's up? Well. Is somebody sending you funny stuff? No, no. It's not, not, not funny stuff. Oh, okay. How much time? Gadwill is bringing up a very valid point there in the chat room. Is your chat room working for you, John, tonight? Yeah, it, it is now again. It's back up and running? Yeah. John's got a, a cool setup now where he, he's actually able to see. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have any cameras that, that display it, but John, if you could just point. This monitor here actually right. shows the chat there. room. Yeah, there you go. So John's able to monitor uh, the chat room as well as uh, see the broadcast on the uh, big screen there. With the camera above, I was also pointing at yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah, the camera's on top of the monitor there as well. So that's uh, we're trying to step up things for John so that he can be a little bit more involved in the show. John, of course, uh, we've had some some talks about uh, about John uh, becoming the director of the show. So for the past few weeks, you've been <clears throat> kind of stepping into that role slowly but surely. So uh, we're we're trying to step things up with that regard. I just so. wanted cool stuff around me. He just wanted to be surrounded and monitored. You got and cool guys around you. What more do you need? Uh, oh, uh, stuff. He just Stuff. is envious of the fact that I can just randomly reach over here and pull out a Star Trek communicator. I can even pull out a DS9 communicator. I mean, it doesn't matter. You just tell, them, tell me the show. And now if I get one of those USB TOS communicators, then I'm golden. Wow. Fantastic. Anyways, Gadwell was asking about <laughs> Becca's due date. Uh, Becca is 37 weeks pregnant now. That's relatively pregnant. So she is due on the 22nd. She could have the baby at any time so mm. if so you're just trying to warn people there may be a Tuesday when kind of John and I people. are sitting here saying well what do you want to do now you, you want there another could round be a of Tuesday not, there could be a Tuesday where John and Eric another round of rummy says you know what we're, we're not cribbage? able to do it <laughs> oh I thought you meant rum and coke <laughs> <laughs> so there could be a Tuesday up, up and coming where for some strange reason there is no broadcast so I'm just going to let you know and people can pass that along if that happens I'm hoping that uh We'll still be able to broadcast through everything. So, but uh, that's going to take priority. <laughs> you can say that. So, baby is due very, very soon. Very soon. Very excited about it. All right. Yeah, that's our third kid. <laughs> DS9 for the win, says Raptor 222. DS9 for the win? Yeah, Deep Space Nine. Uh, Corey saying Voyager for the win. And this doubles as a Voyager communicator, just for the record. So, it's all good. Wow. Well, I, I'm at a loss. I don't. You don't have too many geeky things around what? you that you can just grab at. Well, you're right there. <laughs> I'm right here. Just. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I'm gonna tell you what else is going on in the newsroom. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Moving right along, then, as some would say. Well, I mentioned Google sues the United States of America. That is some. some yes. Tom Halwerda, editor for osnews.com, was thrilled to be able to post such a headline last night after Google announced its lawsuit against the U.S. Department of the Interior, whose request for quotation for a new messaging solution demands the use of Microsoft software. With 88,000 employees, the Department of the Interior is looking for a single hosted email and collaboration services solution. But the catch is that it must use Microsoft's business productivity online suite, federal. Meaning, no matter who gets the contract, Microsoft wins. This, of course, did not sit well with Google.
In Google's complaint, Microsoft software is cited as having serious downtime issues and security vulnerabilities. OSNews.com calls this marketing talk, but affirms that there is truth in there. While we don't know what the outcome will be, Google carries some serious clout and a large and valuable bid. There's no doubt they'll fight to ensure their ability to participate in the bidding process. The Category 5 TV newsroom will keep you apprised as the story unfolds. That is going to be quite a story. Despite reports of OpenOffice.org receiving a promising future from Oracle since they bought Sun Microsystems, the developers began to fear for their beloved alternative to the commercial office suite from Microsoft. With worries that Oracle would do <clears throat> with worries what Oracle would do to the OpenOffice.org, what it had done to OpenSolaris, a handful of the developers decided to start a side project called the Document Foundation, with their pilot application being LibreOffice, a fork of OpenOffice.org. Oracle did not take kindly to the conflict of interest the Document Foundation represented among its developers and has asked the founders to step down and go their separate ways. The Document Foundation team is taking Oracle up on the offer to part ways and is taking 33 of the OpenOffice.org development team with them. Whoa. With companies such as Google, Canonical, Red Hat, and Novell liking the idea of the Document Foundation, it is quite possible we'll be seeing LibreOffice in an upcoming distribution of our favorite distro, rather than OpenOffice.org. To wow. find out more about the future of the free office suite, visit DocumentFoundation.org. Wow. Come on, kids, let's try to get along. The Russian government is not happy with Microsoft's practices and with a dedicated budget of around 4.89 million, 150 million rubles, has announced it intends to create its own internal operating system based on Linux. We will become independent of Windows, says Windows, says Russian deputy and computer expert Ilya Ponomarev. Why do I do that to you? Ponomarev. I, I, I should have taken a, a, a look at a that. quick perusal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Ilya, who admits it will be difficult to create and implement an operating system secure enough for government use. The details of the Linux-based operating system will be hashed out during a meeting scheduled for December. Okay. Credited for the largest security breach in the Thames Valley District School board's history, a 15-year-old boy from London, Ontario, has been charged after hacking into his school board's website and exposing the passwords of 27,000 high school students on October 23rd. Wow. The breach took the teen around an hour to exploit, but has thus far taken the school board more than three weeks to fix, which is raising some eyebrows, as in today's world, it is standard procedure to store passwords in an encrypted format, a practice that we now find one of Ontario's largest school boards is not actively employing. So far, students and parents have been without access to the web portals, which were shut down to protect user data for three weeks. These portals provide access to student marks, timetables, and absentee reports. While London computer expert Sean Adamson admits the sophistication behind the hack was not very high, calling it a Mickey Mouse stuff, the teen has been charged with intercepting a computer function, fraudulently obtaining computer services, using a computer with intent to commit a computer offense and using a password to commit a computer offense. This type of charge could lead to up to 10 years in prison depending on how the Crown proceeds. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, you know. Okay. Wow. Get the full stories at Category5.tv slash newsroom. The Category5.tv newsroom is researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions from Gadget Wisdom Guru, Becca Ferguson, and our community of viewers. If you have a news story you think is worthy of on-air mention, email newsroom at Category5.tv. What happened to the slap across the wrist mentality? Yeah. Or the, like, let him be. This poor well, kid. Well, poor kid. Well, he's 15. He knows better. He's Come 15 on. years old, but man, am I ever lucky that I didn't grow up in this school system. Ooh. I now was, the truth comes out. I was doing stuff like that when I was 14. Wow. 
<laughs> wow. Seriously, I mean, if they're not going to encrypt their passwords in the database... And oh, so, so they deserve it? No, no, I'm saying? not saying that, but I mean, take it as a wake-up call and say, wow, it's good that this kid exploited this problem. Oh. Let's change all the passwords, let's encrypt them, and do things right for a change. Well, the, chat room, story, what do you but, think? Yeah, what do you think? What do you think? It sounds to me like a 15-year-old kid who... who <laughs> but it sounds like, like this professional said it was a Mickey Mouse job. So the kid probably was able to get into the like a SQL database and grab all the passwords and put them up on a post or whatever. Yeah, but For you know what? I could probably break into the office and go through the filing cabinets and it would be really easy. So because it wasn't that secure, it's okay? I don't think so. No, I know what you mean. He knows he shouldn't have done no, it. No, it's of course, it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. But don't punish him like he's a big hacker. Don't put he's him in pretty jail big for hack 10 job. years. Okay. No, he's a kid who was like, oh, this is cool. I can get into the school system. <laughs> Community oh, service. This Community cool service for this hacker. Something like that. Yeah, or okay. Make him a teacher's assistant or something. <laughs> That's what they did to me. <laughs> that was my punishment. I spent grade nine teaching computer science. That was fun. All right. Yeah. Well, brilliant stuff. What do you think, Chatroom? What should the boys' punishment be? And hey, should they instead be put them in a Mickey Mouse outfit? No, should they be punished? Should saying... they be doing something about the the? IT people who apparently they hired to build this system that is so insecure that a Mickey Mouse job could get around their security. Okay, being inept isn't necessarily a crime, though. But you would think that the, one of the largest school boards would hire people that are not inept. Okay, so now we've gone beyond the IT department, we've gone to the uh, HR. No! Who hired these guys? Okay, well, it's somebody's fault. I don't know that it's a 15-year-old kid's fault. It's probably Stephen Harper's fault, on some level. You be careful. <laughs> 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 the higher up you get in the government, the scarier this gets. <laughs> Somebody's watching. <laughs> All right. Let us tell you how to win a printer. We've got that fabulous brother, MFC. I want my nano dots. Well, yeah, you want some nano dots? I got some nano dots but for you. I won't play with mine. I got an, we're not bringing them on the air ever again. <laughs> ever again. <laughs> We've got the MFC J615W all in one multifunction center from Brother. What I'll get you to do is go to category5.tv, click on interact on the menu, and at the bottom, win an MFC J615W. All you have to do is click on that, follow the directions, and, uh, and there you go. There's your chance to win that fantastic printer from Brother Canada. Can I enter? You can enter, you can't win. Hey, <laughs> I figure Sorry, until dude. I get put on Sorry, the payroll. <laughs> That would seem a little bit fishy. Oh, look, Eric won. <laughs> Walk away with light. Here, here's your printer, Eric. <laughs> oh, you're so concerned. Get onto with our what website, category5.tv. Click on interact, and down at the very bottom of that menu, you'll see how you can win that brother multifunction center. And we would love to give that away. So. Hillary wants to win it. Of course. Hillary. Fantastic. When you're on sabbatical, Hi, Hillary. can you win? Huh? Hey, Hillary. When you're on sabbatical, can you win? That's the question. Hmm. She needs it for school. Everybody donate your ballots to Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want to show you, uh, this is uh, segment number seven of our feature on uh, basic photo manipulation. Uh, this is the first time that we've gotten into it uh, during season four. But I uh, wanted to get into tonight just a real quick tip that I can give you that you can memorize and, and put it into employment. Uh, anytime you're using the GIMP, uh, and it will work in Photoshop too, very similar kind of effect. Uh, to take any photograph and just give it a little bit of an oomph, give it a little bit of a uh, standout, a little bit of pop. So I've got this picture that I took of Becca, and I'll just open it up into the GIMP, GNU Image Manipulation Program. And right off the bat, the photo is not a bad photo at all. Colors look nice when you when you look at the photo, but what I'm going to show you, you're going to be able to enhance that photo in such a way that you'll actually see that as, as dull after right. we're done here. And it's a really, really quick procedure to do this. I'd be careful uh, calling the picture of your sweetie dull. It's not my sweetie just, that's dull. It's okay. the contrast I'm just and the saying, colors, be cautious. The levels. 
be cautious. The colors. Okay. <laughs> Baby, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on the image and go layer. Duplicate layer. For those who remember when we've looked at layers, what that's done is it's created a copy of the image. So now I've got two copies that are identical of this image. So if I draw all over this, okay? <gasps> you and then put I, a mustache and stuff? Come no. Yeah, but just nice. to demonstrate what the layer okay. does, if I turn off that top layer now, it's gone because the bottom layer is, see, it's just a copy. Okay. Right? So let's put that back to the way it should be. I'm going to delete that layer by right clicking on it. Right click, layer, duplicate layer. So now I've got those two copies. This top layer is the one that's currently visible. The one below it is basically like if we were working with pieces of paper stacked on top of one another. The one that's on top is the one that you can see. So I'm going to right click on this with the top layer highlighted and go filters, blur, Gaussian blur. With a Gaussian blur you're able to now I'm just I'm dragging my mouse here. I'm clicking and dragging to move to a portion of the photo that I can actually see. As opposed to dragging your knuckles. Right. I can't really, it's such a high resolution image that I can't really get in there, but I'm going to try a blur radius of 20 pixels, both horizontal and vertical. Basically what I want to do is I want to give this a little bit of a blur on the entire photo. So let's see how that looks. That's pretty good. So there's with the blur. I'm going to turn off that layer again. You'll see there's without the blur. So you can see the difference if I compare them back to back. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that top layer and I'm going to change that to an overlay as far as the mode of the layer goes. I'm clicking mode. I'm going to go overlay. So now that's going to apparently darken the image. So now if I turn off that layer again, there I am back at the original image. Here I am with that extra layer on top. Now what I'm going to do is right click on that and go down to colors and desaturate the image. This is just going to desaturate this one layer and now I'm going to hit OK. So now what you see has happened to my layer is that that layer is now actually black and white. This layer is color. But this layer here is an overlay. If I change that back to a normal, a normal mode layer, you'll see that it actually is a black and white layer. I'm going to change it back to overlay so that you can see the effect. So now you can see how Becca's image has, has become, the, sh the shadows are really, really crisp. The, the colors are really nicely saturated. It has a little bit of a, almost a, a subtlety to the photo. But, and you may not actually really see it right away. But watch what happens if I turn off this layer and just put it back to normal. There's the original photo. Now do you see what I'm saying about how this looks dull compared to the vibrance behind that photo? So now what I'm going to do with that layer on, I'm going to create a new layer and I'm just going to make it transparency. So this is just going to create an empty layer. So now I've got this layer which does absolutely nothing at this point. If I turn off all other layers, there's nothing in this layer. Okay, I've got my elliptical marquee, it's like a circle here, and I'm going to drag and create an ellipse from one edge of the photo, just get my mouse back there, down to the other edge of the photo, not quite touching the edge of the photo. So now I've got this kind of an oval shaped marquee. I'm going to right click on the photo once that loads. I am working with a high resolution photo. Uh, at about 4,200 pixels by 2,800. I've right-clicked on that. I'm going to zoom in a bit. And I'm going to go Select Feather. Now keep in mind, a feather of 5 pixels is going to do nothing for me because the photo that I'm working with is 4,200 pixels wide. So my feathering, I'm going to want it to be at least 200 pixels. I'm going to say probably about 300 pixels. So now I've hit OK. I'm going to right click and I'm going to go select invert. So now my marquee is, if I fill this with black, which is what I want to do, remember I'm, I've got my highlighted layer here that is absolutely empty. 
I'm going to edit, fill with foreground color, which happens to be black. See over here? That's black. Edit, fill with foreground color, and that's going to fill just that area. So now if I change that to overlay as well, that layer there, that gives me too subtle of a, uh, that gives me too much subtlety, so I don't, I don't want that. So what I'll do is I'll change the opacity of this layer. It's basically just a, a lens border kind of thing. And what this is doing is it's giving me this bit of a shadow around the image. And we want it to be just subtle. And I might have even used a higher number than the 300 pixels that I used. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll turn off that layer and I'm going to try again. I'm going to go new layer. This is the neat thing about working with layers is you can keep retrying. Right. You're not going to hurt anything to, to that, keep going. That might be the right one, but let's see if we can get a better exactly. and, then and when you're still working, have the previous one. Yeah, so I've saved it, but it's, uh, it's turned off. So I've created my marquee again. First thing I'm going to do this time is I'm going to invert my selection. Select. Invert. And I'm going to go select feather. And let's let's see what uh, let's try five hundred to see what that gives us. And it is you know, sometimes I, I know you've you've worked with photo manipulation enough to to know that there's a lot of there's a lot of trial and error you'd say. But it's yeah. more experimentation, what works with each photo. But the concept behind it works every time. So now that I've got that feathering, I'm going to go fill with foreground color, which is black. Now you can see that's got a much more subtle edge to it this time yes, around indeed. with 500. So now if I change the opacity of that, you can see that that's just giving it a little bit of a subtle kind of shadow around the photo so that my subject becomes the actual subject of the photo. I can move that for cropping purposes. So I'm going to crop that photo, image, crop to selection. I created a square marquee. So now there's my photo. Okay. So again, there's the photo now. Looks really sharp. It's got some really nice color saturation. Now let's revert back to the way it did look. There it was. Back to our manipulated version. Everything kind of pops a lot, a lot more. And that photo, that photo manipulation technique can be used on pretty much any photograph. As long as it's a color photograph, you're going to have that nice saturation effect coming through. And that first step of blurring the uh, the top layer is going to just give it that kind of subtle glow that the desaturated uh, layer is going to give you. I used to do that a lot. I mean, not with layers, but in the old movies, just a little bit of a blur on the mm -hmm. on the actress just to yeah um, very similar approach in Photoshop absolutely was, yeah. yeah same tools same tools found in different locations but the GIMP GNU image manipulation program is a free application that you can download for any operating system like any of the main operating systems Linux Windows Mac uh, so make sure you check that out it's GIMP.org G-I-M-P.org yes actually I've used it on Windows and it works quite nicely yeah. on Windows as well as on Linux Used it in both places. It's a Very good little program. Very good. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Nice to have you here. You'll find us online at www.category5.tv. Any questions come in during that time? Or? I don't see any new ones. All right. If you have a question for us, you can join us in the chat room, category5.tv. We've got about uh, 10 minutes left of the show, so I still have time to probably answer one or two more questions. See you, Hillary. Oh, Hillary left the chat room. All right. I don't know. I've, I think I've read this one before. Have you read it? I don't know if I read it on air. <laughs> well, it helps to read it on air. Eric, yeah. Considering that's how I hear about it. Well, let's. Uh, this is from Angel D. Rodriguez. Oh, hey, Angel. Or, uh, yeah, okay. God bless, Robbie. I work at a local school Cheers. as part of the technology team. With the help of Ubuntu and Category 5, we've been able to increase our job efficiency. I put together an Ubuntu box and created shares where we store and access our files from anywhere in campus. 
We are increasingly using mobile devices, iPads, iPhone, etc., to gather information, scan, and access data. We can normally access any of our data with Windows Explorer, Finder, and Nautilus by entering the IP or computer name of the Ubuntu box. Here's the question. Is it possible to have the Ubuntu shares be accessed via a web browser interface? If so, how do I go about getting it set up on our Ubuntu box? I get home sometimes after 5 p.m. He may not be able to watch this live, but he'll okay, check it out after. Yeah, sure. The, uh, the tool that you're probably interested in is called Apache. It's a web server application that is going to allow um, you to access your computer as a server through HTTP protocol. So that basically look, makes it look like a website. Uh, in order to install it in Linux, let's do it through the terminal. You can do it through Synaptic Package Manager for sure. But why don't we hop over to the terminal just to, uh, to give us a chance to get familiar with that. So that's under Applications, Accessories, Terminal. So from here, what I want to do first is sudo apt-get update. Oh, if I could type, that would assist us. sudo apt-get update is going to connect to my repository list and make sure that I've got the latest. Uh, basically, so my computer knows what the latest version of all the applications are that are available for my computer. With Linux, you don't have to go out necessarily on the internet and find different applications to install. They're already readily available to you uh, on your computer. With a Debian-based operating system such as Ubuntu, uh, such as Mint, such uh, any of the Debian derivatives, uh, you're using an application called apt. Uh, or apt-get. If, uh, if you're using something that's RPM-based, you're going to be using an application called yum. But the technique is very similar. <coughs> so from here, now that I've done that, I'm going to go sudo apt-get install. And you can do Apache, but I'm going to go PHP 5. And what that does is that's a meta package, which is going to install. See the suggested packages, and the following extra packages will be installed. Apache 2. See all that? So all the stuff that is required for PHP 5 is going to be installed. So that's your Apache server. So this is going to configure everything for you. Now, obviously, I don't already have an Apache server installed on this computer. So if I go HTTP colon slash slash localhost, for example, I'm not going to get anything right now. It just says unable to connect. Okay. Is that similar to, I know what you want, but I'm not giving it to you? Kind of, sort of. Okay. It doesn't know what you want. So let's do that. Uh, sudo apt get install php5. With this question, I'm going to say yes. Always read if it's going to remove anything from your computer. But you'll see that this is now getting all the packages from the internet that I need in order to set up this server on my computer. Beyond this, there's really nothing that we need to have in order to do what you're looking to do, which is to access your files through uh, HTTP. So here it comes. Everything's getting installed. All the libraries and utilities. Selecting and unpacking and... Look at it go. Beautiful stuff. All that stuff in, in the past or on some other operating systems, not to name any names, you'd have to download and install all these packages potentially manually. Here, it's all automated. It's what we call a meta package, and it does it all for us. It's done. All right. Let's see what happens if I try to connect to localhost now. If we were successful, if I try again, Apache reports, it works. Here's the default web page. So now what we want to do is we want to change the document root of our web page to point to, um, to point to your folder. So a simple Google search, or use your favorite uh, search engine for Apache change document root in Ubuntu, just to confirm where Ubuntu places that configuration uh, folder. Let's see. In uh, apparently etc slash Apache 2. And then there should be apache2.conf. But I think that may be old. Yeah. It'll be sites available, I think. 
So I'm looking at, let's see. I've gone to this folder, slash etc, slash apache2, slash sites available. And you'll see there's a file called default, sudo nano default. Oh. This is my editor. So this allows me to change the location of my slash. Okay, So you want to go through this file and uh, modify where your files are actually being loaded from uh, for the document root. Here it is here, slash var slash www. So instead, if I create a folder on my desktop, for example, called test, and then in here, I change my document root to slash home, slash probby, slash desktop, slash test. Then, once I restart Apache, I'm going to have access to all the files that are there just by going to localhost, or in your case, connecting to the IP address or the host name of the computer that is serving those files. So that gives read-only access to those files to, uh, to anyone who has access to uh, HTTP to that server. So Security-wise, you'd want to make sure you're behind a firewall to make sure that uh, only internal LAN users have access to those files. Uh, and beyond that, it would be anyone who can connect through port 80. You'd be good to go. So, And using Apache HT Access, uh, learning to configure an Apache server, you can do a whole lot more and be able to configure that thing with lots and lots of security. You can even host websites on it. Um, if there's an index.php file or index.html file in any of those folders, uh, it will automatically load that as if it was a web page, and you'll be uh, you'll be rocking. Very cool. That'll do it for you. This is Category Five Technology TV. You'll find us online triple w dot category five dot tv. You're reminding me to show you this, and you yeah, don't even know what it's about. I know. Just I just had a demonstration for you. SpongeBob SquarePants. Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? Yeah, sorry. I'll stop. Oh no. I didn't drop did you, that one. Did you get I to did this? not drop that one. My kid's five years old and this happened. Oh. What's your excuse? <laughs> <laughs> they were devastated. What are you going to do with that, eh? It's like Clonezilla. Crazy glue. Crazy glue? Did that work for Clonezilla? I don't think so. Boy, oh boy. That could have been a mess if the kids actually put that in and tried to fire it up. Oh. <gasps> Dear me, that would explain why the DVD player is not Looks a lot like one of the fellas I was playing hockey with, his skate blade broke. <laughs> boy, did he hit the ice hard. Yeah. <laughs> boy, oh boy. <laughs> nice. You're not supposed to do that with your DVDs, folks. Well, there's another crack here. Remind the kids. Yeah. Brilliant. That, my, my dear friends, is why we use the application DVD Rip and Archive. I've got a DVD shelf that John's looking at that uh, <sighs> all those videos I've archived just in case. If it's worth saving, it's worth backing up. That's a backup, yeah. Said the guy who lost all the data from his Blackberry. <laughs> Sad story. John, it's been nice having you here tonight. Yes, yep. a very good night again. Lots of fun? Very good. Everything Fantastic. Nice. Good to have you here. Nice to finally have a mic on you. It'd be nice mm -hmm. that, uh, we'll, and we'll get everything tweaked out and, and uh, good. that'll be good. Yeah. yeah, it's great. Thanks for being here, Eric. Thank hey. you for being here. And thanks for joining Robbie Ferguson, our local guru. Yeah. Is that what they call me? Well, that's not what the locals call me. No, no, it's not. Hey, you. You crew. crew. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Have a great night, everyone. We'll see you. Category 5 TV is brought to you in part by Planet Calypso. This massive multiplayer online game is available as a free download from cat5.tv slash Calypso. Now, once you've got it downloaded and installed on your Windows computer, make sure you say hi. And there's something for everyone here on Planet Calypso, from hunting to mining, crafting, and just plain socializing and having fun with your friends. You can download it for free at cat5.tv slash Calypso. If you're a Linux user like myself, of course, this makes it worth the dual boot. Cat5.tv slash Calypso. I'll see you on Planet Calypso.